Reading with your kids. Hola, niho, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, mahaba, moni muliwanji, namaste, jambo, bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted and so honored that you're joining us in our mission to help families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, Ghana, Himalaya, Stitcher Radio, wherever you find your podcast. Our guest today is Lisa Yee. She's here to celebrate her new middle grade novel. It's called Maisie Chen's Last Chance. Before we invite Lisa into the studio, I want to invite you to visit our website, readingwithyourkids.com. I really want to encourage you to sign up for our free newsletter. A lot of great things are happening here at the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Behind the scenes, we're doing some really neat things that we'll be introducing in the not-too-distant future, and we don't want you to miss a thing. There, there's going to be some great things that you're going to want to share with your kids. Uh, some great guests that are coming up, and uh, and maybe some video too. And, and like I said, we're also we're going to be launching a TikTok page, so we want you to be be the first to find out all about that. So please go to readingwithyourkids.com, uh, cl- sign up for our free newsletter. It will prompt you when you get there, I'm inviting you to sign up. Also, please feel free to use the contact button on that homepage to send us a message. Let us know what we're doing right. Let us know what we could be doing better. Let us know who you would like to hear on the podcast. And, of course, we'd love for you to connect with us on social media, facebook.com slash readingwithyourkids, at readingwithyourkids on Instagram, at Gently Magic on Twitter. Joining us right now from Los Angeles in California, where she is hiding from the winter that she would be experiencing here in her native Massachusetts. Our guest today is here to celebrate her brand new middle grade novel. It's called Maisie Chen's Last Chance. Please welcome to the show, Lisa Yee. Hey, Lisa, how are you? Hey, I'm good. Thank you. I'm excited to have you on. Tell us about Maisie Chen's Last Chance, please. Well, Maisie Chen's Last Chance is about a girl from Los Angeles, born and raised in Los Angeles, like I was, um, and... She has to go to Last Chance, Minnesota to see her grandparents. Now, she's only met them once before, and she doesn't really want to spend the summer in the middle of nowhere. But when she gets there, she discovers that there are lots of secrets and things that people aren't telling her. And it's a, the book is part mystery and history, and there's a lot of Chinese food in there because she's helping her grandparents at their Chinese restaurant that's been around for over 100 years. And while she's there... There are um, some hate crimes that are visited upon the family, and she decides that she's going to try to solve the mystery of who did it and why. And at the same time, her grandfather starts telling her about her family history, which she knew nothing about, and about her great-great-grandfather, Lucky Chan, who came over in the mid-1800s, and he founded the Golden Palace Restaurant, which is the restaurant her grandparents now own. So it's it's kind of a parallel book. Um, about a contemporary girl from Los Angeles, but it's also about this Chinese man who came over as a teenager well over 100 years ago. You know, I think that's something that a lot of people don't realize is that a lot of our our, uh, uh, Chinese neighbors have been here in the United States for over a century, certainly longer than my family's been here in the United States. Yes, yes, for for many, many generations. And a lot of them came over to work on the railroads and the transcontinental railroads. There were over 20,000 Chinese who worked on those. Yeah, it's fascinating that history is fascinating. But what's also fascinating is that there's so much history that we don't know. I don't want to say that was hidden from us. It might have been hidden from us, but it certainly wasn't celebrated the way it should have been. Yeah, I mean, that's a good that's a good uh, way to, to state it. it. It's not hidden. I mean, it was like nobody is saying that it's a secret, but it's the kind of thing that, um, like I, for example, didn't learn about any of this in school. You know, it's not in the textbooks. It's 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 um 
is just kind of maybe you could say it's a little bit of forgotten history mm-hmm. that um you know i'm i'm trying to do my part to unforget it and to bring it to the forefront now yeah what kind of research did you do, did you do to to become more familiar with this history um i did a lot of research i talked to railroad people um railroad experts um i visited the chinese american museums in los angeles and san francisco and new york and um a lot of reading just just a lot of reading and talking to people mm-hmm. you know you you mentioning the railroad and one of the things i was absolutely when i found this out i was absolutely my my mind was blown that before the rail the transcontinental railroad was built the quickest way to get from boston to los angeles would be to get on a boat sail down to panama get off the boat, walk across the continent, get on another boat, sail on up to California. That's just, it's just mind-blowing that such a, a an, an extensive journey would actually be quicker than making your way straight across the continent. Yeah, no, the, the Transcontinental Railroad changed everything. It, it changed, um, it, it united parts of the country, and it was terrific. It was also bad in a sense where um, a lot of indigenous people were, um, relocated and that's how they word it Mm -hmm. um and uh but you know it was all in the name of progress and so then they had these um chinese laborers come over because they were so much cheaper than um than the people the white residents and what they would do is there were these huge mountains that they had to blow through to put the railroad tracks down and so they would they would pick uh, a young Chinese man, and they would lower him down with a stick of dynamite. And he would put the dynamite into the mountain and light it. And then his friends and fellow laborers would try to pull him up in time. And often they were unsuccessful. So there were a lot of lives lost on the railroads too. Wow. I I can't even imagine that. Just that, that gee, good luck. Yeah, but that, you know, um, in those days, uh, life was cheap. Mm -hmm. And um, for the Chinese anyway, um, they were considered less a human. Mm -hmm. um, So they were dispensable. Mm -hmm. What was the the thing that was most surprising to you as you were doing the research? Um, I guess what was most surprising about it was the the amount of violence that was visited upon the the chinese i i i i didn't realize there was so much i mean i knew there was but when i was researching and it's actually very well documented um mass lynchings things like that um i wasn't aware such there there are our our nation has done so many wonderful humane things in our history but we've People in in the country have also done some pretty horrific things to each other. You're absolutely right, and it's not just the Chinese. It's it's uh, you know all the immigrants, mm-hmm. and not even just the immigrants, but it's the indigenous people too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I guess it's just that that thing that you mentioned. Not you know, people from China who came over to work on the railroads were, were looked as less than and as an other and i hope that that somehow we can we can use books to help our kids grow up understanding that we're not we might look different we might eat different foods we might speak different languages our families might have come from different parts of the world but in the end we're all part of one beautiful human family yes yeah and and that's the um the truth about Maisie. i mean she you know, she, her family had been here for several generations, but she didn't know any of this history. And growing up in Los Angeles, you know, she was just, you know, she just looked at herself as just another kid at school. But when she goes to visit Last Chance, Minnesota, where her grandparents are from, where her mother is from, suddenly she is the only um, kid of color in the entire town. And that's something that she didn't have to deal with when she was in Los Angeles. Mm. And that must have been an incredible change and challenge for her. It was. It was. Yes. It was um, quite a bit of culture shock. Yeah. 
You know, as you're mentioning that, as uh, I, I was sharing with Lisa before the show, I think I was sharing with her that I do educational magic shows around the country and doing these shows for over 30 years, I've gone to parts of the country that I never would have gone to in a, in a million years, parts that, you know, you don't even find them on the map, just very rural, out of the way places. But in every one of those places, you'll find a Chinese restaurant. So at some point in time, a daring Chinese family would would move and set up a take the risk of setting up a business in in these communities and in most of those communities they would be the only person um of color uh yeah you're absolutely right and i was you know i was interested in that like why are why is there a chinese restaurant seemingly in every small town in america and i started looking into it and way back in the day cooking was considered women's work uh. but the Chinese men would do cooking. They would also do laundry, which mm-hmm. was also considered woman's work because, you know, and, and so um, once the Chinese restaurants started opening up, it was kind of like a network of, of Chinese helping each other. And so they be, they began to help each other and setting up their restaurants and everything. Yeah. What a, 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 a beautiful story of, of, you know, coming together, supporting each other, helping lift each other up. Yeah, and, and you were talking about earlier, you said about all the Chinese restaurants everywhere. Um, you know, in my research, I found out that there are more Chinese restaurants in America than Burger Kings and McDonald's combined. Um, I am not surprised by that at all. Mm-hmm. I, I, I was surprised, though, one day um, uh, we host international kids here in our home, and we've hosted uh, half a dozen kids from China. And uh, one uh, we decided one day one of the students arrived at our home a little earlier than expected and my wife and I had plans to go out to a Chinese restaurant in Boston and um, so we invited our student along and the first thing she said to us was this isn't Chinese food <laughs> right There's, there are American versions of that and um, I talk about that in the book because um, one of the first things Maisie sees her grandmother serving is cream cheese wontons and she asks her, she says, is this American or is this Chinese? And her grandmother says, yes. yes. <laughs> well, I mean, but that's a really, um, I think that's a really important thing for kids to see is that there has been such a fusion and, um, you know, the, the, the what Chinese American culture has a lot of American aspects to it and a lot of. American culture has been influenced greatly by the Chinese. Yes, absolutely. And for Maisie, she's finding this stuff out at the same time the reader is, because growing up in Los Angeles and um, being an only child, she didn't know any of her relatives or any of this kind of stuff. So for her, it's fascinating when her grandfather starts telling her stories about her great, great grandfather and him coming over from China. She, she knew none of this. Yeah. Yeah. I, as I'm thinking, one of the things that, that I'm really kind of sad about, uh, my grandfather immigrated from Ireland, and when he arrived, his attitude was, I came here to be American, and didn't teach us, I know nothing uh, about Irish culture, I really don't, um, and, and uh, you know, and that's, he'd probably be happy about that, because, <laughs> you know, yeah. he immigrated to be yeah. American. It's absolutely right. My my grandparents came over from from China in the early 1920s, and it was so important for them to be American that you know they wanted every they wanted to do everything American. And so when my grandmother gave birth, they had a German midwife, and to her, this German midwife looked white. So to her, she looked American. So she had the midwife name my aunts and uncles, and that's why. I have an Uncle Otto and <laughs> Uncle Albert and Aunt Verna and an Auntie Harriet. I mean, it's because to her, those were American names and her children were going to be Americans. <laughs> <laughs> what, a, what a great story. Uh, what, one of the things that, that I've, I've heard from authors is that they really kind of grow as they're writing stories. I was wondering what kind of ways do you, 
how did you grow as you were writing Maisie Chin's Last Chance? Oh, uh, in in so many ways, I was I was writing the book, and then um, we started having, you know, this thing called COVID. Mm-hmm. Uh, you might have heard of it, and yeah. yeah, but a little bit. And so I'm writing it, and all of a sudden, there's this anti Asian hate that started happening, and it it just threw me. It was a, a shock to me, and so I started um, putting some of that in the book, not about COVID, but about um, perceptions mm-hmm. that people have. And, and I really had to look into myself and into my heart as I was writing this book about how I wanted to approach that and how it affected me and how it would affect Maisie. And at one point I was so stifled that I, I, I couldn't write. I was so upset with what was going on and I wanted to help and I didn't know how I could. And I eventually told myself I could write. Mm-hmm. If I can finish this book, that maybe can help. Yeah. Well, you know, as you're saying that, I'm thinking, you know, we talk a lot here in the podcast that, you know, books can be mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors. And I definitely see how Maisie can be a, a wonderful mirror for Asian kids, Chinese kids to see themselves, to get to know a little bit of their history that they might have missed out on, like like you did, to understand what their 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 grandparents and ancestors went through to, to come here and to build this country. And I think it's important for, for the rest of the kids in here in, in, in the States to see that Maisie is just like them in so many ways. Yeah. Oh, exactly. And that's my hope for, for the readers because it's not really, it's not really a story about race or anything like that. It's a story about a girl who's finding out about her family. And that's something that we all have in common. And I remember growing up, I didn't ask my parents much about them. I didn't ask my grandparents. And hindsight, I wish I did, because the stories that I could have heard as a young person would have been amazing. And, you know, I would hope that my readers, after they finish reading Maisie Chan's Last Chance, will ask their friends and family, well, what was it like when you were a kid? Mm-hmm. And how did you feel? And, and just, you know, what happened? Yeah. And, you know, we're talking to a pri- an audience of primary, uh, primarily uh, adults, parents, and teachers, and other caregivers. And, and I would like to just encourage those people who are listening to start the conversation. Because you're right, there are a lot of kids who aren't they, they don't feel comfortable. They don't know what questions to ask. Just start sharing stories. The crazier, the better. My kids have heard some doozies. I hope they don't repeat them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. I do remember um, one time my mother telling me that, you know, my, my grandmother, you know, she because she wanted to be so American, um, she spoke English, not not really well, but she spoke English, but she was very proud of being able to speak English. And my mother, as a as a young child, though, would often go with her to the market. And one time they went to a Chinese butcher, and my grandmother decided that she was only going to speak English to the butcher who only spoke Chinese. So my grandmother spoke English to him. My mother had to translate my grandmother's English to Chinese to the butcher. And then he would reply in Chinese, and my grandmother would pretend she couldn't understand him. And my mother would have to translate back. But that was, you know, I mean, that was like one of the things that, that you know, my grandmother did, you know, to prove that she was an American. Mm-hmm. I, I think I'd like your grandmother. She sounds feisty. She was. She was. <laughs> I have so many stories about my grandmother taking me to the pro wrestling matches at the Boston Garden as a kid. I hope you're writing these down or sharing them with your kids. <laughs> I'm definitely sharing them with my kids. Uh, you know, when, when your publicist, when she uh, set this up, she said that Maisie Chen's Last Chance was a celebration of food, family, and fun. And as I was reading that, I just, uh, that, that, that student who went into the Chinese restaurant and told us that this isn't Chinese food. Her and I became so close and she loved to cook and she taught me how to cook some amazing Chinese dishes, authentic Chinese dishes, including dumplings from scratch, from the flour. And it was such 
it was family. I mean, it was f- really fun. It was a real celebration. It was long. It was all day long. <laughs> but it really brought us together. We we bonded in that day over those dumplings in a way that was it's it's just hard to describe and i'm so grateful for it there's something about food that yeah. brings people together it brings all sorts of people together and in the back of the book there's a recipe for cream cheese wontons ah okay and my grandmother had taught me how to make wontons in fact today though I was thrilled to find out on Instagram of a person called Storybook Cook looked at the recipe and made cream cheese wontons and posted it. Awesome. 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 So what a great, we, we always talk about encouraging families to continue to read with their kids after they become independent readers, especially after they become independent readers. I think Maisie Chen's Last Chance would be an excellent book to co-read with your kids uh, and even read aloud with your kids and have those conversations on the way to ballet or on the way to soccer, on the way to school when you're in the van. You're, you're spending time in the van with your kids anyways. Shut off the music that is almost certainly inappropriate for you to listen to, never mind your kids, and have a conversation about a great novel like Maisie Chin's Last Chance, and then go home and make those cream cheese wontons together. What a great time. Or at the very least, order Chinese takeout. Yeah, order Chinese takeout, but it wouldn't be as good as, uh-huh. as cause that was one thing about those, those dumplings. They were the most delicious dumplings I have ever had in my life. I've, I've made them again, not from scratch. I cheated. She would be upset with me. If she knew. <laughs> but, I, I, I buy the pre-made wontons. Here, so. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I buy the wrappers and I fold, but, but I know the, the recipe for the fillings inside. But I always, I always fill it too much. So it, it comes apart and, you know, but, but it's delicious. And um, what a great memory. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. What else are you working on right now? Well, I am not, I am not allowed to say too much about it because it hasn't been announced, but I can say that it involves pirates and pastries and a jewel heist. Pirates, pastries and a jewel heist. Mm-hmm. I'm fascinated. One of the the things I learned here on the podcast is that the most successful pirate of all time was not Captain Blackbeard, but was actually a woman from China. Yes, I've heard of her. And now, now of course, my mind is blocked and I can't think. But yeah, you're right. I know who you're talking about. Yes. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, my my interest is definitely, definitely peaked. Where can people go to find out more ab- about Maisie Chen's Last Chance, find out more about you, and to be the first to find out when you make the announcement about the next project? Um, they can go to my website, lisayee.com, and you'll find out all about Maisie, and there's a lot of fun stuff and games and things like that there, too. Yeah. I think there are some pictures of you at a Comic-Con or something. Am I right about that? Yes. Yeah, so I wrote the DC Superhero Girls novel series. And they're novels about Wonder Woman and, and Supergirl and Batgirl when they were in high school. Uh, and uh, it's all about them before they became the iconic superheroes that we know now. So I went to a lot of Comic-Cons. Uh, I bet you did. They're a lot of fun. They are. They're overwhelming. But they, yeah. they're, yes, they are. Yeah. They're different. And boy, I've, I've been to a bunch myself. I've had a great time speaking with you. We've This has been so much fun. Thank you. I've had a great time, too. We've had a great time speaking to the author of Maisie Chin's Last Chance, Lisa Yi. Hey, Lisa, thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you for inviting me. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. We'll have two wonderful authors on. Rochelle Tarfman Perez will be on to celebrate three Ps for potty. And we'll also be welcoming Jasmine Williams to the show. She'll be here to celebrate Hungry for a Snack. That is the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Hey, if you are the author of a fantastic children's book, you may be frustrated at how very difficult it is to to let the world know about your book or at least, at least to 
let the world or help the world get interested in your book. There are literally thousands of books published every single month. You probably had no idea when you set forth to, to write your children's book. There are thousands of books published every single month. It is really hard to stand out in that huge crowd. Well, we would like to help you. So many ways that we can help you celebrate your book here on the Reading With Your Kids podcast. You can be a guest on the podcast. Sit, sit down with me in a long-form conversation. Tell the world about your book, about your inspiration, about you. Help build your brand. It's fun. It's easy. It doesn't cost a thing. You can go to readingwithyourkids.com. Click on the author's click here button at the top of the page and scroll on down to be a guest. You can also, from that same drop-down menu, find out how you can submit your book to our certified great read panel. If they believe that your book is worthy of four or five out of five stars, it becomes a certified great read. And with that status comes a number of really powerful tools to really help your book stand out, to let families know that your book is worthy of their consideration. You can also find out about our promotion programs. We can create a wonderful package of podcast commercials, social media messages to our 75,000 plus social media followers, and also display your book on our nationwide network of digital pedestrian billboards. Learn all about that and more by going to our website, readingwithyourkids.com. Click on the author's click here button at the top of the page and scroll on down to our various services want to thank the folks who made this episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast so much fun. Starting with our guest, Lisa Yee. Please be sure to check out Maisie Chen's Last Chance. Also want to thank my team, Fatima Khan, Rory Grady, Skylar Strauss. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always... Thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading with Your Kids podcast.